Okay, my, my name is Bill Colley. I was the head of school at New School Butterston until November 2018. Um, uh, I, prior to that, I worked in, as an independent consultant specialising in autism, social and emotional behavioural difficulties, in tribunal cases. I did quite a lot of pro bono work as well in terms of supporting families and children who are going through difficult times, often um, through the social care system. Prior to that, I worked for Perth and Kinross Council as a quality improvement officer and manager for additional support needs. I did that for about three years, uh, having prior to that worked as a principal teacher of support at Perth Grammar School. And before Perth Grammar School, I was head teacher at New School Butterston 2002 to 2006. So I came back to the school in Jan January 2018 at the invitation of the governors because they wanted to put um, more support in, in terms of the development of the school as a business. Uh, the, the job of uh, quality improvement officer manager, it changed quite considerably. There were changes in personnel. Um, there, it, there were a lot of challenges in terms of meeting what was a growing level of need in the pupil population with what were very limited resources. And then I was informed in 2013 that the senior management team of, of the council had decided to cut funding to 24 out of 32 secondary support for learning teachers or pupil support teachers. And that decision was had been taken, and it was my job to develop a strategy and to lead on on the change. Uh, I decided that it was not a very sensible decision. Uh, most important part of it for me was the fact there'd be no process. So the, the a, a very significant financial decision has been taken without any sort of planning, without any impact uh, assessment or analysis. And to be asked to lead on something I didn't agree with meant that really my job became untenable, so uh, I resigned that post. <clears throat> yeah, initially I came in um, recognizing that the management needed additional support. They'd been through a very traumatic 12 months or so uh, how, with a loss of a tragic loss of a pupil the uh, absence of the head of education who had been very seriously injured in a, a car accident and the, a lot had been going on I, and I could see that from a business perspective the I think that the I had been taken off developing the school as a business and and obviously a, a school like a new school the primary focus is on education and care but you also have to have the revenue coming in in order to be able to to sustain the business itself so I could see there was a huge level of need nationally and, and locally. Even within Perth and Kinross, there were at the time about 180 children who weren't attending school. And I, I saw the potential of the school to meet the needs of those, of those kids, but also to have um, a national market. And I, I, th there was no business plan, there was no marketing strategy as such. And I saw that we could affect quite significant change quite quickly if we put certain things into practice. And that, I worked with the school and we were, we were very effective, I think, in pushing up demand to the extent that by the time the school closed, we were at what was a break-even point. At the, at the start in January 2018, it looked as if the school would close in the summer. The, the numbers looked as if there would be about 17 or 18 pupils, which was simply unsustainable. But by the time the school did close, we were at 24. I was expecting us to be at around between 30 and 35 by Easter 2019. So from a financial, financial point of view, the school was, was becoming very, very successful. Uh, but my, my overall impression, I was quite um, shocked at the high quality of care within the school. When I think back to my previous role in 2002 to 2006, we had a care team of, I think it was three, and care wasn't professional, it was just something that happened. Uh, care was defined almost in terms of getting the children showered and up in the morning, rather than delivering anything in a proactive way to support their particular needs. Uh, when I came, came back, uh, this time in 2018, very, it became evident very quickly that it was a very caring community and a very joined up community. It's one of the, the strongest teams of professionals I've ever worked with and characterized by the lack of any sort of personal or professional ego. People just got on with the job. Uh, very collaborative, very cooperative, a lot of humor, 
a lot of flexibility, professional humility, I think, as well, wanting to know uh, where you've got quite complex cases, particularly around anxiety, uh, identifying different types of anxiety, uh, customizing support programs to individual pupil needs. And, and it just struck me that when I initially came in in January, I thought it was a good school. By the time I left, I thought, I thought it was an outstanding school and um, where, where the, the whole emphasis is on caring for young people. Yeah, the, I think what's become clear since the school closed is how difficult it is to find something that suits our, our particular client group. And it's not a homogenous client group. There, there, there are huge differences in terms of cognitive ability, in terms of the nature of the anxiety underlying some of the children's problems. So it, I don't think there is a specific client group, but the gap in the market it, uh, or in the current service provision appears to be with kids who have average to above average ability, often most on the aut autism spectrum and with specific issues around anxiety and demand avoidance. And the majority of the pr provisions in the country are dealing with uh, kids who have significant learning disability, uh, complex and enduring uh, difficulties rather than this particular group. So this, this group, it, it looks, it's, it's what we often refer to as in, invisible disability. They are significantly disabled by the fact that they cannot engage in mainstream learning, educational activities, or sometimes mainstream living. Um, but they, they don't appear on any particular list in terms of uh, meeting eligibility criteria for specific types of service. So the new school seemed to be very innovative in a, addressing a need that wasn't being met elsewhere. Yeah, I think it was uh, December 2016, there was one young man who had left the school. Um, he, he, I think he'd left when he was about 17, and much against the wishes and the advice of staff in the school who felt that he needed to stay on longer um, in order to develop the independent living skills and the resilience that he would need later in life. But he, he had been persuaded to leave, um, having been promised quite a high level of support. But in 2016, he was living in um, what was sort of hostile accommodation for homeless young people, rather than a, a service that was designed specifically to meet his needs, and had been complaining about uh, feeling bullied by some of the other residents, not being happy, and he took his own life uh, that December. And it had quite a big impact on the school because the school had stepped in to provide him with volunteering opportunities, so he was still a visitor to the school, he was still coming up and getting quite a lot of support from certain members of staff. So when he took his own life, uh, there were staff in the school who were very angry about what had happened to him and the lack of support that, that had uh, occurred. Before his body was found, because he jumped into the River Tay, the, another young man who was a 17, 17 year old at the school, very vulnerable, quite complex in terms of mental health needs. Um, he was also coming up where, for a review where it was going to be decided whether he could stay on for another year or whether he need to move on to college. The parents, the young man himself, the parents, school staff felt that he was, didn't have the resilience, his mental health was very fragile, he'd, he'd only been in the school for two years because he'd really been failed in education prior to that. And the recommendation was that he should, should stay on for another year. Uh, and they were desperate for that to happen. But uh, the authorities decided otherwise. And then three days after he was told that he would not be allowed to stay on at the school, he took his own life within the school. And that had an enormous impact emotionally on the school itself and in terms of the relationship between the school and the authority. So when I arrived at the school, there was a I think a lot of people are very numb. Uh, there's still evidence that of trauma and, and staff were receiving quite high levels of support. What was remarkable is the pupil population seemed to be quite resilient, but the, the staff themselves were still recovering from those two recent tragedies and from the loss of the head of education. So uh, to some degree, the, the development of the school had stalled and understandably so, they'd focused on, on making sure the students were okay and the families were okay 
and it was a, in a sense, a remarkable achievement. But the needed one of the reasons I came in was to try and move things forward. But what the, what the managers at the time, the head and the head of education, were sensing was a very high level of hostility from Perth and Kinross Council in terms of the, uh, the the conduct of the reviewing officers. The head of school refused to go to meetings alone with them because he said that when he came out of the meetings, his views were uh, misrepresented. Uh, he all meetings were had to be audio taped because the council officers would insist on meeting minutes being changed, uh, information being added or information being taken out from meetings that had been recorded. So there was a sense of mutual, a significant amount of mutual distrust and it, it wasn't healthy. It was very different to when I had previously been in uh, as head of the new school when we developed a very collaborative relationship with the authority. We held joint conferences, there was very good communication, there was a high level of trust and this was just the complete opposite. And I think what happened in the authority was when I left in 2013, there were a couple of other key individuals who also left at that time. And appointments were made which, in, on reflection, may not have been best for either the school or the authority. And since then, 2013, the, the authority has found it very difficult to meet needs. They've been involved in a lot of tribunal cases, which they've lost and they've had to back down on tribunals uh, because there are so many young people whose needs aren't being met within the authority and needed somewhere like the new school. So you can understand the context from both from the point of view of a fund manager within Perth and Ross Council, a budget holder, that the school was seen very much as a threat rather than a service which could meet the needs of pupils who they couldn't meet, uh, whose needs they couldn't address. Uh, the, the school was draining their resources and I think that that was one of the main drivers, as well as the perhaps some vulnerability on the authorities' part for the two deaths that had occurred over the previous 12 to 18 months. Yep. I, so I was working within the within the school, <coughs> primarily from a business perspective. But um, it was around about the end of January that uh, Chris, head, the head of school at the time, received a phone call from Roger Hill head of secondary and inclusion at Perth Kinross Council to say that a complaint had been submitted to the Registrar of Independent Schools. And Roger Hill wouldn't tell, say to Chris what the complaint was about, just to, say, to notify him that a complaint had been made. So we were left wondering what, what, uh, what could be going on. Uh, and the thought struck me at the time that if there were concerns within Perth and Kinross Council, why hadn't they contacted the Board of Governors? Why contact the Registrar of Independent Schools? And it just led to a sense that there was a strategy developing whereby the authority were trying to cause reputational damage to the school by instead of addressing things in a normal way uh, through the, the governors to try and bring in external authorities and external regulators to uh, take a critical look at the school. When, when the complaint eventually came through, it, it was, um, and it's never been examined. What, what's interesting is that since February 2018, nobody's actually looked at the Perth and Kinross Council complaint and examined it in any great detail. When we put our response into the registrar, we felt we'd made it very clear that the concerns raised by Perth and Kinross was spurious, they indicated a lack of understanding of pupil needs and the outcomes for, for two of the young people who were mentioned in that complaint have been extremely poor uh, because of the actions of Perth and Kinross Council. In fact, one young person who left New School Butterston eventually ended up in secure accommodation and is currently in a, in a very, very serious position. Um, and yet they complained at the time that the school had allowed her to eat a fairy cake. And that was the basis of the complaint. Uh, the, the main ones, yes. There's one part which, um, where I think the authority reference the, the difficulties that management in the school were having at the time because of the circumstances. and. With the loss of the head of education, people shifting position, the huge burden on management of having to address the the aftermath of the tragedy of February two thousand and uh, uh, and seventeen, I think the 
Yeah, w management was depleted, it was stretched, it was struggling. So in that respect, I think the, that part of the co complaint was valid, but not to the degree that it should have warranted unannounced inspections and the sort of subsequent criticism that's taken place. My, my view is that in different circumstances, the school would have been held up as an exemplar of good practice for the way it dealt with what was a very profound tragedy and the way it bounced back from that. Can you talk about, um, so so after the Python and Ross complaint, very soon after, um, the school was faced with two unannounced inspections? Not not straight after. The complaint came in around about uh, early in February, March, early February. Um, th then Chris reti retired as head of school and I was asked to take over. And it had never been my intention to um, go back to being the head of the school, but I'd seen so much good work taking place and I saw how vital it was to many of the young people that they had a provision like the new school. And I was also, we were seeing, because of the efforts we were putting into developing the business side of things, we were seeing a lot more visits to the school, people were much more interested in the school, local authorities were approaching us rather than us going out and having to sell the, the services that we, we were offering. And there was also a, a good buzz within the school, it was a good place to work. A uh, sense of collegiality, camaraderie with the staff. Uh, I, basically, I was I was enjoying it. And but one of the main attractions was it was going to be very very tough. Um, we were we were facing closure in the at the end of June. It was a, a big big challenge to take it on. But I also believe that because the level of demand is so huge in Scotland for a service like this, that it was worth saving. So I I agreed to take over, and then four weeks into my tenure. Just as pri previously in 2002, s straight after taking over, there was a double unannounced inspection. What was interesting about it this time was the contrast with 2002. Um, back then, in, in my first stint as head, the school it was genuinely struggling. The quality of care was not what I thought it should be. It needed a, a a big change in culture. Uh, it needed to feel a lot more positive about itself. I think the inspectors came in expecting to close down the school in 2002, but they were very professional people. They were very constructive. They were very high caliber people from both what was the care commission at the time and uh, HMIE. And they, they looked at the school and they uh, discussed things with me and they decided to to give it a go, and they supported me uh, considerably in getting the school back up, up to the standard that it should have been. This time, it was completely the opposite, and it seemed like, well, I, I had staff approaching me saying, this just doesn't feel right, this inspection, it's as if the report has already been written. We're not getting eye contact from the inspectors, they're not, they're not open, they're not, they're not discussing matters with us, it's, it's as if they've got a, a very single-minded approach to, to finding something negative about the school to say in the report. Uh, and so there was a sense of unease throughout that, that inspection in May. Um, the end, in the end, the Education Scotland report was far more negative than we had expected or I think could be justified. But the, it was the Care Inspector report that was most shocking because we were standing from the previous inspection with grades that were in the, the good or very good, the very, very good, good level. When we get, got the feedback in May, and we were expecting to hold those grades or possibly improve upon them, but the feedback came back uh, and we dropped two grades across three categories, which is virtually unprecedented. It, n normally that would happen if there's been a big shock to the system, but Given the work that the head of care and other members of staff had been doing on the care plans, on developing m much more professional, rigorous practices around the delivery of care, it was inexplicable. Did you meet all of the recommendations from the previous yeah. inspection report? Um, had you, had you, can you demonstrate that you'd improved in all those the yes. measures since the previous care inspection report? Very much, sure. yeah. Okay. And we, we tried to, uh, or. or I, Head of care in particular tried to work with the care inspectorate. She had sent a copy of our child protection guidelines in March to them for review, but they got no response. 
I had asked questions, because one of the issues in the Perth and Kinross complaint was about um, an allegation that was made uh, by one autistic individual against another autistic individual. And it raised some interesting questions about child protection and disability. So uh, I, I had tried to work with the care inspectorate, set them some questions, given them some questions, some sort of dilemmas, situational dilemmas, and asked them for guidance on how these might be dealt with. But again, there'd be no response. Uh, and it just struck us that the that we, whilst we were trying to forge a decent relationship and a collaborative relationship with both Perth and Kinross Council and with the care inspector, we were getting nowhere with them. Do you have copies of those emails that you sent? Yes. So, so there was a general level of concern about, about the inspection. There was a feeling that they hadn't come in with an open mind. And the, going back to the, the Perth and Kinross letter of concern or complaint, uh, we, the registrar of independent schools didn't make any judgment about it. He just said that there needs to be an improvement in the relationship between the school and the authority, which we agreed with and we're, we're trying very hard to, to do. But when the inspectors came in, one of the first things I wanted to do was to take the complaint and go through it and to uh, to see if there's any justification for it. But they refused. And I, that, that struck me as being quite strange because the whole basis of the unannounced inspection was the, the, the complaint from Perth and Kinross Council. And we became, I think, all of us, both the management and staff generally, we were quite uneasy during the inspection process. And it was made more so when the education inspector engaged in a professional dialogue with the teachers and her opening comment was that there were two members of the school, two pupils in the school, who were at risk of suicide and she wanted to know what measures were in place to mitigate that risk what pl planning had taken place, what communications there were. And staff were extremely unsettled by that because as far as they were aware, there were, there were no kids in the school who were at risk of suicide. And, and she named the two pupils that she had identified. I checked up in all the care plans. I checked up with all the staff who knew them, I contacted the parents who were extremely upset to be told this. Uh, and I, I went back the next day and said to the inspector that you know, this was completely untrue. And um, she was very evasive at that point. I then contacted Gail Gorman, the head of the Education Scotland, and it was her PA or, or someone close to her who spoke to me. And one of the very first things she said to me was, we are politically independent, you know, which I thought was, was a very interesting comment to make when I hasn't raised any question uh, about, about independence. But it, it just gives a sense that the, the, the inspection itself was, was quite unsatisfactory. We met, um, head of care, Angie and myself met up with the care inspectorate in, I think it was July, to go through their, their findings to try to get some sense uh, of how it was possible for the gradings to drop so dramatically. They were unable to produce any evidence uh, other than what were quite spurious things like, what one comment was that there was a sentence unfinished in a care plan. Another one was that there was the, the packet of some cream had been left out in the medication room. Quite low level stuff like that. And, and what, what it brought to my attention it re really supported some of the work I'd done when I was studying for uh, an MSc in advanced residential childcare was the nature of, of care, the nature of care inspections in that the care inspectors themselves aren't trained in additional support needs. They're not trained in mental health. They're not trained in residential school environments uh, or leadership in those environments. So they, they, act, they tend to be guided by uh, formulas that have really been developed for other types of care establishments like old people's homes and so on. It, it's very much a system and process based approach rather than looking at care itself or trying in some way to measure care itself. And that's I think where some of the difficulties arose that they weren't able to see the extraordinarily good work that was taking place in the school. All they saw was slight niggles in terms of the bureaucratic process. Uh, they, they certainly couldn't answer any or justify any of the drops in grades that had occurred. One of the requirements from the inspection was that we had to have a separate policy, a young adult protection policy. 
for those youngsters who are above the age of 16. And we questioned them about this, and they said, no, it's a, a national policy of the care inspectorate. So I went and looked at all the other care inspections they'd done for similar services like ours, and there's not one that I'm aware of that's had the same requirement. And, and, and it, it just reinforces the idea um, that had been developing over a period of months that the new school was being very much targeted, that there was a strategy uh, to, to, to effectively close the school by imposing restrictions that wouldn't ordinarily be imposed on other services.